So uh, we have Martin Lemay, who's our CISO here at Devolutions, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the CISO challenge and everything that's entailed in that today. At the end, if we have time, we'll have questions. Uh, just put them in the chat and uh, I'll go ahead and answer them. But if not, at the end of the day, we also have a, um, a happy hour session. It's going to be super relaxed uh, where we can have a time where you can ask him and he's got a couple of things he wants to talk about, little nitty gritty that have to do with uh, cybersecurity and other things of that nature. So Martin, thanks again. I'll just, I'm going to shut off my mic and uh, uh, and my camera, and then I'll let you go ahead and start off the session. It's going to be wonderful. All right. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you, Yam. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I, I wanted to try something different. Um, I used to talk more about more technical uh, stuff like cryptography, penetration testing, uh, and I wanted to, to build, you know, a, a, I want to talk about the approach of becoming and being in a CISO role. So the Chief Security and Information Security Officer here at Evolutions and all the hurdles uh, uh, in the journey. Um, there's not a lot of talks uh, uh, about that kind of stuff. There are a lot of talks on what you should do in management. There are a lot of talks on what you should do uh, on the on technical parts, research and all that stuff. But from an experience point of view and, and a journey, uh, through going from a, a role to another is, is pretty rare. So I wanted to try something new. I'm a bit nervous. It's the first time I'm doing this. It's the first time I'm giving this content to you. So I hope you will appreciate. And uh, we'll, we'll move on uh, with a bit about me. Um, I have a technical background, uh, 10 years, uh, including penetration testing, of course, but also in telecom industry. Um, I have some uh, project management and technical coordination experience. So I've managed projects and, and got used to deliver and manage expectations to deliver some project within time and budget. Uh, also, uh, I'm a cybersecurity passionate. Uh, I have a make it happen attitude and a father of two. So uh, I'm a cool guy and I love what I do. That's basically it. And I want to talk about my past experience as a penetration tester. Um, it's pretty simple. You scope the thing, learn about the thing, break the thing, get the profit, and repeat. What I mean by that? Being a penetration tester is basically you have an engagement and you have to hack some target. Uh, sometimes the scope is really, really narrow up to one application or service or, or pretty broad, like a whole business. And uh, the thing is that it's pretty easy. You do the job, you hack the customer, you report on how you did your, uh, your work and put your recommendations in it. And this kind of, uh, of a just a life, you know, you just take the plane, uh, land somewhere, uh, rent a Camaro, go to the customer, hack him, and come back. And it's nice. And these jobs, honestly, right now are really on demand. If you have a penetration tester profile, you're basically uh, targeted by headhunters on a daily basis. And the pays are good, the conditions of work are good, and uh, life is great. You also, you know, uh, to do that job, you basically have to master the black arts of cyber. So I said the job. I said the job is easy, but actually the job requires a lot of time, not only on the job but on your personal life to get up and running and maintain your level of effectiveness in, in that kind of job. If you look just uh, uh, on a couple of topics that you need to master here, we talk about cryptography, reverse engineering system, and OS architecture and security, social engineering. Uh, network and infrastructure security, mobile security, and here mobile security, that includes iOS. Uh, not, 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 not really cool, but you have to. Application and database security, there's many database types that you have to, uh, to, to tackle. Malware engineering and AV evasions, mm -hmm. these ones are really crucial to, uh, to your work because if you use a payload that gets flagged by some Kaspersky, McAfee, or Symantec, uh, and for protection, uh, then your work is done. So you have to move uh, around those problems. And this is usually time that you don't invest 
in an engagement, but outside the engagement to make sure you are prepared for the engagement. So if you have an engagement on the two days uh, on a business, well, you have to make sure you don't have to fight with the, their AV solution uh, on site, right? You have to prepare yourself and that means on the weekend, of course, why, why not? Uh, vulnerability exploitation, coding, cloud security, and of course, you have to know all those attack tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, basically, what does that mean? Uh, if we look at the, uh, I think it's Mendy and uh, FireEye that put this, uh, this cycle uh, public, uh, it's a typical attack life cycle, right? So on an engagement, you will basically either focus on one of those, uh, one of the, the, the steps or a combination of those steps. So if we look at the recon, that's basically, basically means, you know, from an outside uh, perspective, what are the uh, open source intelligence that you, that, that you can query to uh, uh, find some targets in the environment? For example, what are the DNS subdomains for the target? What are the GitHub repositories for that target? Are there any information that's useful in there? Are there any documents in Google that can help you identify, uh, for example, the username uh, scheme and stuff like that? Uh, and then you move on to the initial compromise. Initial compromise can be uh, physical uh, intrusion. It can be an email. It can be a USB key. It's basically the first part of the attack. That's the active part of the attack. So you are basically trying to get in the business. Then the next step, the very next step is to establish persistence. Because what you want, you know, is to have an access and make sure you stay there even if the computer shuts down or if the server shuts down. So the next step is to establish some kind of persistence. And then you have that cycle here of escalating privileges, internal recall, lateral movement, and data. Analysis. Basically, is moving and gathering information to the organization to identify your final target to perform the exfiltration and complete, of course, complete your mission at the end of the cycle. And this is basically done via a C2. So a command and control if you have, uh, if you are from an external, uh, if you are ex uh, not inside the business, but the attack occurs through the internet. So you have to understand all this stuff and you also have the MIT attack, attack framework. The MIT attack framework, you have the pre-attack and the attack for enterprise. And now these are more focused on, on techniques. If you go to initial access, you will have all types of initial access that can be used. Same thing for execution, persistence, privilege escalation. So basically it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of uh, time that you have to invest in, in your skills and, and knowledge because each environment is also different from one from another. You can have an environment that's only uh, Mac uh, and, and another one is only Windows, another one that's a, mi a mix of, uh, uh, of uh, multiple stuff. Or perhaps you have an environment with very old and deprecated systems. So basically it's a, it's a tough job, but basically we always win. And um, why do I say this? Because it's a fact. Red vs. Blue, the security is as strong as your weakest link. That's always true. The blue team, uh, the defenders, have a bunch of systems, services, and applications, thousands, millions, maybe uh, mm -hmm. a lot more. And the attacker has only one, need one problem in that chain to get in and steal your data. And not only he needs only one, one door open, he has all its time to do it. So that's why we always, you know, promote defense in depth to make sure that you don't have one door. If one door is compromised, you don't access directly to the data, but there are there, there there's a need of multiple layers to get through the data. But I mean, that's a great advantage that they're uh, abusing and uh, exploiting right now. And uh, if you've seen uh, Nick's talk, Nick Espinoza's talk uh, earlier today, he was absolutely right about the first law. If there's uh, something to exploit, people will exploit it. Uh, if you look at the DFIR report uh, for Ryuki, I think it's pronounced Ryuki, 
um, the uh, the malware that in five hours can compromise uh, an, an entire enterprise, and uh, it did so in this uh, in this report by abusing uh, the zero logon vulnerability, which is the CD twenty twenty fourteen seventy two. Now, when that vulnerability uh, was uh, became public. Uh, here at Evolutions, uh, my, my first thought was, you know, it's going to get exploited. So we we decided to proactively updating uh, the uh, domain controllers, updating the servers, but not many people knew that it was not enough to just update the servers, but you also had to enforce a policy on the server to make sure that uh, the, uh, the the vulnerability was not uh, was not exploitable anymore. So, um, right now it's exploited in the wild. Uh, if your business is not aware about uh, Ryuki, well, uh, a, a simple email can just get through, exploit some vulnerability on your server, and then go laterally with uh, a Cobalt Strike, any fine WMI, uh, and PowerShell to complete its objective, which finally uh, resumes to sending, uh, encrypting your files and asking for a ransom which can be pretty big, where we're talking about millions of numbers here. If we look at the uh, other vulnerabilities, uh, Microsoft in October, the 2020 patch here in October, uh, 87 vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and we had that, I believe it included the IPv6 stack uh, uh, problem, or, or this one was in November, I'm not too sure. Um, but there was uh, a pretty uh, huge amount of big problems in that patch. And we're talking about 87 vulnerabilities for a product that lists for over uh, decades, right? We also have the Oracle, uh, or should I say Miracle in July, uh, patch update, 433 vulnerabilities in their applications. So, there, so that makes a lot of potential doors for attackers. And we also have VMware. VMware, I found it funny because I just typed, you know, in Google VMware security advisories vulnerabilities, and this is the first page I get. And we see that we have a critical one uh, in November, 4th of November, and we have a bunch of CVs right there, and the patch is critical. So many vendors uh, have, the vulner have vulnerabilities in their software. And uh, I mean, these are potential doors for attackers if you don't patch them. So it's a it's a good uh, behavior and habit to 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 patch quickly, but we all know that's uh, much more difficult in practice. So with that in mind, when I was offered the job here uh, at Devolutions, uh, I mean uh, I was uh, working as a consultant here uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, finally the job was offered. Do you want to be the chief security officer here? We want to. Uh, we want to get a step above, uh, you know, one, one step ahead of, of the threat landscape. We want someone here responsible for uh, the security of our software services and also uh, for, for our own assets. So I thought that, you know what, I, I, I have a good profile. I know exactly how attacks are performed. I know recommendations that can be applied to them. And uh, hopefully, I'll do a great job uh, at securing our products and services at Devolutions. And, uh, and I did. But turns out that the first quarters, I was always saying, you know, all good, all good, everyone, right? Um, what, what happened? Uh, it was a lot harder than expected before. Why? Well, I made some rookie mistakes. Uh, poor ex executive experience. because. I thought project management, you know, delivering projects on budget in time uh, was a requirement. And it turns out that uh, at the executive level, it matters, but it does not matter so much if we have to move the boat, right? So budget, we can, we can play with budget. We can add money or remove money depending on the situation. It's not just putting a project and, and trying to finish that project. It's about uh, being uh, aware of the environment, right? Uh, of the trend and, and adjusting to, to unknowns. So uh, understanding the business is the top priority and it's not, it, it, it's not 
for the security folks to teach security to the, to the business, but it's, it's for the security to understand it, to be teached how the business is running. This is the top priority. And that's where you can really drive a value and, and a strategy that aligns with objectives. Uh, there was also uh, a lot of security uh, related initiatives that, that result bringing more work to everybody else and, and slow down velocity of the business. Um, you cannot just uh, be in a process and say, okay, if security hasn't checked it, it's no go. Well, yeah and no, it depends how much time it takes you to say yes or no. If it takes you weeks, for a little problem that usually takes five minutes, well, there, there's a problem. You're, you're, you're a bottleneck to the whole business and you're not really appreciated. And if people don't like you, well, it, your security program just don't work. Uh, so uh, it, it's, uh, um, it, I had to change the approach. And uh, unfortunately in the first months, I, I did fail into that. Uh, risk in context is not equal to vulnerability scoring. When you are a penetration tester, you use CVSS, you know, the common vulnerability scoring system. And you say, you know what, that vulnerability is at level uh, seven. You need to fix that now or 10, whatever. You need to fix that now. But without context, I mean, it doesn't have any value. If you try to implement a vulnerability management uh, in, in a software shop, uh, a vulnerability management program in a software shop, and uh, you arrive with a, a CVS score of high, but the priority in the pipeline for, for the fix is low. Why the priority is low if the security scoring is high? It's just a question of context. It's because the exploitability uh, for the component where it is and the way it is used is not as much important as other, other stuff. And that's it. So you cannot just use CVSS in your business to try to build a, a vulnerability management program. You need it though to have some baseline and have a common ground of discussion, but you cannot just rely only on that. Also, quick wins are really good. Uh, quick wins were fun, you know, it's not much effort and you uh, improve your security posture, but that doesn't necessarily keep you uh, quiet at night, unfortunately. You do a lot of stuff, but you know, uh, you understand the big picture. And you know that unfortunately, uh, there are some bigger holes uh, around there. What also doesn't help? I don't know, maybe framework standards and best practices? I knew them all. Uh, I went through them and, and tried to understand and figure out how would prioritize uh, their content and use them. Turns out it was not as easy as I expected initially. Uh, there are a lot of differences in context where you can use them. For example, the CIS controls is really, really good for the cybersecurity basics, but it's mostly on technical focus. You have column for organizational you know, controls, but uh, these are not really enough compared to what ISO or, or NIST CSF can bring uh, on the uh, organizational side. You also have uh, high trust if you have an, an high, a HIPAA uh, environment. That one is nice because it can overlap through uh, many, many other uh, frameworks and, and standards. You also have the a, uh, AICPA SOC uh, 1 through 3 for service providers, just like we have for the Evolutions Password Hub. Uh, we also have the PCI DSS for uh, uh, payment card information. Now I insist here, if you process a lot of payment card information, people tend to um, to go dramatic around that. If you have no other uh, regulation, that could be a nice one to start with. And uh, this can be also uh, a mm -hmm. good driver for uh, implementing a security program. Compliance is kind of uh, a useful one because it's easy to it's easy to sell compliance, you know, because the return on investment is, is clear and it's easier to understand. If you have the certification, mm -hmm. it proves that you do it right. And if it proves that you do it right, then you have a checkbox on the customer side for their uh, procurement process or for their auditor to, to, to check in. So it, it eases um, your, uh, your, your, the, the buying pipeline for your, your customers. And of course, the NISSP, uh, all the SP800 documents that are uh, highly uh, technical, uh, 
really, really deep in information that can be useful, but you know, uh, don't try to, uh, to comply to all of this, especially if you're starting the program. I also found this one. This one is really uh, funny. It's about this CISO mind map. I, I laughed so much when I saw this because it it's kind of real. I mean, uh, you're uh, involved in governance, you're involved in, in identity management, risk management, legal and human resources, um, security architecture, security operations. You're, you're kind of the, the, the guy in the middle of, of all this. And, and for smart organizations, you know, for, for SMBs, um, you tend to have tentacles over there and be personally involved uh, rather deeply in all those, uh, in, in all those fields and, and not just only on top of it. So uh, there, there's a lot of stuff to cover here. And the job, which I thought it was prior, uh, it didn't, prior to that, was a bit different, right? And uh, of course, there is a lot more topics uh, that I want to talk about uh, on the uh, after hour it happens today. A uh, lot of fun topics, uh, stories that happen here, uh, especially uh, my first month when the VP of sales and marketing targeted me with a malware. I'm going to talk about this uh, later on. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I have a, a lot of good stories <laughs> about the solutions there, and uh, I hope you you come in uh, uh, in numbers. Uh, another thing, uh, another topic that I came across was in uh, a report uh, uh, that uh, that shocked a bit the social medias when it came out in February two thousand nineteen. Uh, it's about uh, the mental health of CISOs. There was a study where one in six CISOs medicate or use alcohol. And uh, the main problems here is, is always, you know, the, uh, the visibility on the infrastructure, the buy-in of the management and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's easy to have the imposter syndrome, especially when you've moved a position from one to another like I did. Uh, or uh, paranoia, fear of, of being act or being act right now. I've seen people totally in shock, you know, because they thought they were they were compromised, actively compromised. Uh, you have the frustration too, because um, a, a good security program will take time. It's not a switch that you put, you know, uh, I'm not secure, too secure. It's not a switch on. It's a project that involves uh, controls, but also people. And uh, it's an environment that, unfortunately does not always move fast. So you have a lot of frustration that goes there. Disorientation, uh, if there is a miscommunication between uh, the CISO level and the top management, then you don't know where the star is. Where am I heading with this? And of course, this creates some sort of the disorientation and you don't know where, where to, to jump yourself out. You also have fatigue, of course, mental fatigue, physical fatigue, and uh, you can also have a losing ground and being overloaded. So lose it by losing ground is that you have so much thing to secure that you can you you don't know where to start and you're just jumping on uh, what the, the priorities and don't have a feeling to, of touching touching ground. So uh, this can be uh, I believe that CISOs will eventually feel at least one or a combination of those kind of stuff. Um, and it's fine. It's okay. You have to be aware of that and, and take the appropriate actions to, uh, to get over it. Now, what, what happened? Well, we, we kept moving forward, right? And we have a security program today. And I know maybe right now, some people are like, well, what a sore loser. Yeah. Wait, 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 we did end up with something great. Right now we have three practices. We have the GovSec, DevSec and OpSec. The GovSec is really security governance, security risk management, compliance, and transparency. All those papers that are on our main website right now, describing uh, the encryption architecture of our software, the SOC2 report, how to report the vulnerability, all this stuff is under the GovSec practice. And uh, right now it goes really, really well. And I have some couple of great things that will come up that I have in a, a, another slide. We also have the uh, DevSec practice 
that includes application security, vulnerability management, and project contributions. This one is the, the, the one that we are early uh, focused on the most. So have a team right now dedicated solely on our uh, softwares and services, and they're really, really good. They're certified by you know international, uh, internationally recognized institutions. They're doing a great work. And right now we are able to not only report bugs uh, or vulnerabilities, but we're also able to fix them. And we're also able to create new, uh, new features and, and, and new additions to our softwares using our expertise. We also have an in-house operational security department. So we have an OPSEC department right now that handles cyber defense, operations and cloud security, incident response management and handling. And that's a nice capability to have to have that in-house. It, it allows us to to tack, to, uh, to exploit some opportunities uh, like having a, an email screening service in-house that might not be uh, possible if we decided to outsource it. Right now, we have a budget of seven percent of total expenses. If somebody uh, is on uh, want to find out how much security budget you need in your program, uh, then so the flat answer is uh, it depends on your business. But uh, the average is between 5 to 10% of the IT expenses. So by being at 7% of total expenses, that shows a, a lot to us that, you know what, we have a good budget for, uh, for a business. And not only we have a good budget, but we, uh, we have a good uh, re return investment on it, and, and we can see how uh, it drives uh, new opportunities uh, in, in, in ours. Um, how, with time, you know, I talked about my hurdles earlier, what changed to, to make this happen. Well, um, I dropped the dad crow behavior and started to, act, to work actively with the business and, and achieve its objectives, you know. Uh, I remember. Uh, some personal clash with uh, me and, and David Hervieu, uh, uh, the CEO, uh, on the first month on, on some topics. And, and he was right. I mean, we have to not only bring problems to others, but we'll, we must be part of the solution. And he was totally right. And as soon as that attitude was, you know, uh, was assimilated, well, it, it, it just went a lot better. Uh, the problem is that when you you work for uh, uh, mm. for many years as a consultant, you are a bit detached uh, of the business, of the context of the, of the business, and and being involved into the solution is a lot harder than it seems. Uh, my team started to contribute to projects rather than identifying problems too. So uh, we're not bringing stuff in in the plates. We're literally taking stuff out of the plates of the other developers, which have. The, the, the really hard um, responsibility to add value to the products and make sure that, that we win the game. We leverage our specialized expertise to help add value to our product and services. You might have seen or heard about the security dashboard. Uh, we have the Evolutions Crypto, which is a, a refactor of our cryptographic uh, usage at Devolutions in our products and services, and uh, a lot of cool stuff that's coming up. I don't know if I'm burning something. Uh, perhaps David will will enter here if I, I'm spoiling some stuff, but some cool things are, are happening on our end. Uh, I accepted the fact too that a sane approach to security is a chaining of small and iterative initiatives. Uh, I had to prioritize better. The problem here, of course, is if I want to secure the whole place at the whole at the same time, it just doesn't work. We have to prioritize. We have to think about business continuity. We, th we have to think about priorities where uh, we want our customers to be satisfied with our software secure, that our secure software, right? We, uh, there, are, there are things that we cannot tackle day one. These things will have to be tackled another day, or perhaps we can do a part today that will improve significantly our posture, but uh, tackle the rest later. Uh, we offered alternatives and uh, also avoided blocking at all costs. So uh, it, it, this part was hard, especially in development, because you don't want to stop development for security. You want security to run as fast as the development and make sure that 
uh, you, you can collaborate at the same speed and not just stop them at your speed. And, uh, and I believe we managed to do that. We are pretty much everywhere in the development life cycle. And right now we have not, uh, we have not significantly um, slowed you know, the, uh, the, the, the development of our products uh, on the, for the security, you know, uh, for, I don't know how to say that. Um, but anyway, uh, I think we've kept moving forward with, with all this stuff and we never uh, quit it and uh, the results just, you know, came in. And uh, our Roma for 2021 is pretty cool too. Uh, we have security advisories that will come up uh, by the end of perhaps beginning of next year. Uh, and that will be cool. Not necessarily many people do that. It's nice for, I feel it's nice for customers to know at what risk uh, they expose themselves if they don't upgrade, if they don't patch the, 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 the security, the, 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 the patch of software they own. And the problem with that is that it's not so easy to publish those advisories. It's not that the problem is not publishing, you know, what was fixed in, in those patches. The problem is in the whole process, make sure that it does work effectively and that those vulnerabilities were indeed uh, put in, in, in each branch uh, or each branches uh, of those applications. So it takes some time and uh, fortunately it will come up uh, soon. So uh, you all be advised if you are a customer of, uh, of ours or not, just follow our blog and, and uh, that will be very cool. We have bug bounties too, currently in private uh, and invitation only. It's a private uh, uh, gang that we have right now and uh, perhaps will be open uh, to public uh, in the, the upcoming years, but we're starting something. We have the ISO 27K1 certification that will come up to early next year. SOC 2 and SOC 3 certifications for both password of business and personal. SOC 2 and SOC 3, uh, SOC 2, sorry, we had we already had it for password of business, but now we're extending it to password of personal. So, uh, and of course, security related uh, uh, feature in addition, including security dashboard, evolution crypto, content notification, security stuff, and leading edge stuff that I cannot talk about right now, but it's coming pretty soon. Uh, well, the good tips I can give you, uh, if, if you ever, uh, if you ever manage a security program, if it's new for you, or if you are aspiring to move into such position, well, the tips I can give to you are bring value. Just don't try to reduce risks. Um, it's like your insurer asking for money each year. Uh, don't be that guy. Uh, it's okay. You know, uh, we should invest, you know, that amount of time and that amount of manpower and that amount of money to reduce that risk. And you'll get an okay for, for uh, most of them, but sometimes it just won't work. I mean, you're not bringing value anymore. You're just reducing some risks and the likelihood of some of them is perhaps just ridiculous. So why go ahead? Read all those frame security frameworks, standards and best practices but don't try to comply with them unless it's a business decision. Apply a risk-based approach and start with the basics. What I mean by that, my first approach was to try to take NIST and make sure we comply with NIST in, in, from the end to end and make sure that, you know what, we significantly pushed for our security pusher. Right now I'm doing something different. I'm, I'm relying on them to get some input, but I use a more risk-based approach to select which one I will focus. And, and this will, uh, this is a better approach and the most, uh, a more cost-effective approach uh, to, to implementing a program. Uh, facilitate the culture change by being able available and frequently uh, sharing security news, tips and tricks. This is something uh, we've done uh, good early at the evolutions. Uh, and we have a great culture for that. We open chat channels where we show news. The idea is to expose your end users to, uh, to the problems, to the threat landscape and, and understand that it happens not only to others, but it happens to a lot of people and it can also happen to you. Uh, you have to be exposed to security to, in, in order to, uh, to, to, to move to a culture of, of risk awareness and make sure that they, they can 
they can think on their own that hey this might be a security risk i should have i should reach someone at security just getting into it and that's why you also have to be available and uh give a, a fast service it's just uh, it's just like an help desk right uh you want to offer a service for your customers and be the fastest and and uh, the, the most uh, give a service of top quality as much as possible uh, don't hesitate to invest in training new talent uh, in-house candidates are the best ones now poaching vp staff for the win um, i'm sorry but security is somehow a specialization taking taking someone from scratch uh, with no business experience uh, uh, no uh, experience in it no experience in development is really really hard to grasp all the concepts of security because security is kind of on top of all this. So having someone else that is used to an application or is used with your IT environment, well, it's easier for them to apply security, to, to be trained and apply those security concepts in the, into their infrastructure. And uh, well, fun fact, we had two external employees lately and those two aren't here anymore. The internal staff that we had earlier stayed because it was easier for them to uh, to get into their roles. Uh, find security champions to help you uh, to help you out. Uh, these can be closer than uh, than you think. I had the uh, the great chance of having you know great people here that uh, that had the uh, you know the security initiative at art, and uh, these are great people for input and feedback. And press continuous training and testing. I mean, this is definitely what will get you sleep at night, uh, knowing that what you've put in place works. Uh, it's easy to put a control in place, but knowing that you know the pen test of your uh, your service provider, uh, they, you know they they had a hard time. They they didn't get to the objective. Uh, is nice. Now, of course, there you cannot rely only on pen test, but I mean. Uh, testing a control over and over again is a great way to get an assurance, some level of assurance that it's working properly. And ask uh, for help and give it whenever you can. We're all in the same boat. Uh, we are, it's us against them. Uh, we are attacked. We are in a world where uh, we have to, uh, to get everybody in the same boat and defend ourselves. It's not by uh, keeping all the, the knowledge inside that you will help the uh, others. So I encourage hardly my team uh, whenever possible to help mm -hmm. uh, either on uh, uh, on uh, local events or uh, on our blog or, 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 or simply sometimes other businesses come to us for, and ask for some advice. I mean, uh, we're all there for that and we should stay strong together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed. I hope it wasn't too hard to follow and thank you for being here.